Our worship is about to begin, so let us quiet our hearts to receive our word.
It will be done via Zoom and in person. So uh, families that have children elementary age, if you would like to attend in person, you need to register at the church. Just give the church office a call. And everyone else can visit via Zoom. And now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've come again to your house this morning to worship you. We gather in gratitude for the countless blessings you give us each day. And we come in search of your loving, comforting presence. Our souls are in need of replenishing. And you are the only one who can provide the nourishment we need. Guide and bless our worship today. And fill us with your spirit. So that we may take your love, your forgiveness, and your grace with us. To guide us when we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now it's time to greet each other. So please stand, wave, and then remain standing. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, Mike, how are you? Good morning, good morning. Stay standing. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, yeah. Exercise, right? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's on your one sheet. And we will sing all three verses, and I need the basses. Look at your bass line. Bring that up. this and, and we, we know that uh, we're in this together. Uh, 
Can you imagine? Uh, well, none of us can. The fact that we're we're going on a year of this pandemic. That uh, this is something that has rocked our world, world, and in our in our own world, uh, our own country, and it continues to be something that just is in our everyday conversation. Uh, you're ready for spring. I, I'm ready for the pandemic to be over. Amen. Are you with me with that? Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, it, it's been affecting us, right? Uh, we, we, need a, we need a good word. We need uh, a pick-me-up. We need something to say, Lord, help. And, uh, you know, uh, I certainly have... Uh, Needed that myself, as anyone, as all of us have. And so that we begin to think, how is it that we begin to be the people of God, to share God's love um, in the midst of difficult times? And one of the things that's probably the most difficult time of any of our lives is when we become aware of our own sin, our own brokenness, where we have messed up. And isn't it those times that we need someone to mend a broken heart, to come in and, and, and heal our brokenness? So our world is broken. Our country is broken. But yet in that, there is the love of Jesus Christ that comes in to mend those broken hearts. But that's what God sent His Son into the world to do. To love each and every one of us. That we would be encouraged with that. So in our time of prayer, I, I want us to, to look at uh, the concerns that we have. Um, Brittany and Brandon and Jameson. Uh, Ramona and Cindy and Charlie and Ramona. We certainly want to remember these. You know, our, our uh, hymn uh, pointed out also that it, it, it's me. It, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. But it says not the preacher's out. Why is, why, why is that? Why does it mention the preacher? Not the preacher. It's not the preacher. Do, do you know why that would be? Because you can't do it. Because I... Because I, I it's not <laughs> You know, it's, I guess it's me. I am the preacher and it's me, oh Lord. He could have said the liturgist. <laughs> not the liturgist. But it said not the preacher. Is that because we blame the preacher? <laughs> okay. But it is a song in which we don't always put, say it's, it's them or it's their fault or whatever. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Well, whether we're standing or whether we're sitting or whether we're kneeling, let's go to God in prayer. It's me. It's me, Lord. And I'm calling on you because I'm in need of prayer. I'm needing to take the time to call out to you because I'm in need and I need help. It's me. It's, it's me, Lord. And I have to come to you again because I've been made aware that I have fallen short, that I have sinned, and that I have not only brought a wedge between you and me, but between my brother and sisters in Christ in the world in which I live. And it's me, O oh Lord, that has sinned and we call upon your name, O oh God, because of our collective sin, whether we have done it in thought, word, and deed, or otherwise, Lord, that we have just failed to be your church. We have sinned. And 
though we really hate to admit it, though we really don't like to talk about it, though we really, oh Lord, wish that we could talk about your grace more quickly, Lord, we, we're going to ponder just a little bit more of our need to change our hearts because we have sinned again against you and against one another. It's so wonderful, oh God, that you are so quick and ready to interrupt our excuses, to interrupt our rationalizations for our sin, and you are ready to offer grace a forgiveness of sins, a saving us from our sins. God, may we know that you sent your Son into the world to save us from our sins, that we might find healing from our sins. And that we, O oh God, might be a changed people because you in our life. And so as you have made the invitation to come to you, O oh God, we accept that invitation to follow you. We accept that invitation to change our heart and life. Because you offer us what is the healing that we need. You are the doctor, the physician that heals us from what hurts and draws us into sickness of sin. God, we're thankful that you are a loving God, a loving doctor that gives us what we need most. And so, God, as we gather together as your people and we cry out to you, it's, it's me. It's every one of us, oh Lord, in need of prayer. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. From Luke chapter 5, we find this story of Jesus, beginning with verse 27. Afterward, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up, left everything behind, and followed him. Then Levi threw a great banquet for Jesus in his home, and a large number of tax collectors and others sat down to eat with him. The Pharisees and their legal experts grumbled against his disciples. They said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, healthy people don't need a doctor but sick people do. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners to change their hearts and lives. Now I'm reading out of the Common English Bible. It's one of the newer translations that's come out. Actually, it's not all that new anymore. I think it came out in 2011. But it does steer away from the word repent. 
Because it's a word that they think that we don't know what it means anymore. And so they've actually, in, the word, in replacing the word repent, they put in change heart and life. That that's what repent means. And maybe if you think to yourself, you might think, well, I thought repent meant, you know, to be sorry and stuff like that. And actually, the word strictly means to change your heart and your life. And then from 2 Corinthians, here Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, and he's been writing several letters to them. But we only have two, but there's evidence of four. And in this letter, he is writing them, 2 Corinthians, he's writing them to let them know that I sent this letter to you, and, and it obviously touched your heart. It obviously began to have an impact on you, and it's brought joy uh, to Paul's life. Now I'm reading, uh, beginning with verse 5. Even after we arrived in Macedonia, we couldn't rest physically. We were surrounded by problems. There were external conflict and there were internal fears. However, God comforts people who are discouraged, and he comforted us by Titus' arrival. We weren't comforted only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he had received from you. He told us about your desire to see me, how you were sorry, and about your concern for me, so that I was even happier. Even though my letter hurt you, I don't regret it. Well, I did regret it just a bit, because I see that the letter made you sad, though only for a short time. Now, I am glad, not because you were sad, but because you were made sad enough to change your hearts and lives. You felt godly sadness so that no one was harmed by us in any way. Godly sadness produces a changed heart and life that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But sorrow under the influence of the world produces death. Look at what this very experience of godly sadness has produced in your view. Such enthusiasm, what a desire to clear yourselves of blame, such indignation, what fear, what purpose, such concern, what justice in everything you have shown yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it wasn't for the sake of the one who did wrong or for the sake who was wronged, but to show you your own enthusiasm for us in the sight of God. Because of this, we had been encouraged. And in addition, in our own encouragement, we were even more pleased at how happy Titus was. His mind has been put at rest by all of you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, follow, when Jesus makes the invitation to follow, following is easy when we agree. Right? When we agree with the invitation, it's easy for us to follow along. But not so much when we don't agree. My mom was a great cook when I was growing up in the house, and she made wonderful meals that we sat at every, every evening. But every once in a while, their, what can I say, liver was put in front of us. <laughs> I was only learned about more recently that it was mom that liked liver. None of the rest of us liked liver at all. But that's all right. She put liver in front of us. And you know what else she did? She put out asparagus and Brussels sprouts and that sort of stuff. And you know what she said about all of those meals? She said, it's good for you, right? I didn't agree. <laughs> I found that um, I had to draw a line somewhere with uh, the food that I ate. Because following people when you agree, it's easy. But when you disagree, it's kind of hard to follow along. The invitation to do what is right is not always the easiest thing to do. In 1973, famous psychi medical psychiatrist Carl Menninger wrote a book. It was entitled, Whatever Became of Sin. And in his book, the doctor projected the day when we would come when
and sin would no longer be. He speculated that the explanation of sin and wrongdoing would be replaced by rationalizations accusing, excusing individual accountability. Meninger predicted the term sin would be replaced with words like illness, disorder, dysfunction, and that the human condition would be excused as a product of our biochemistry, our environment, our experience, our trauma. He projected that even crime would go unpunished as criminal activity would be justified and minimized as a result of some medical abnormality for which we could not be held responsible. According to Menninger, the day was approaching, in 1973 he said this, when we would practically, everyone would be considered sick and they would be pardoned, they would be justified for their behavior. No longer would there be any liability for human error, choice, or willful conduct. In 1973. So why is it interesting? It's interesting to me that why are we still in fact infatuated with sin? Crime and police shows are still the most famous shows that we watch, that the, uh, the public watches over and over again. Think about all those crime shows. Think about all those police shows that we watch where crime and sin is committed and we are fascinated by how it's dealt with. Jesus said, or in, the, in the Matthew it says, you will call him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. So I, the question begs, do you need a savior for your sins? Do you believe in this invitation to follow Jesus is good for you? Because of sin. In 1991, so 30 years ago, Reverend James Moore wrote a book. Yes, entitled, Yes, Lord, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. What a great book. What a great book. Because, you know, it's still at least admitting that, you know, well, we might have sinned, Lord. Yes, we, we, we might have sinned. Yes, it's, it's me, Lord. But listen, Lord, I have, I have several great excuses for why it's, why it's happened. He said that, you know, we have gotten so caught up in watching TV where people are laughing and admitting their sins. And the, what's strange even more is that the audience and us, as we're watching it, we laugh and applaud. He said the problem is not that we hesitate to admit anything. Our problem is that we are learning how to justify everything. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, 8, it says this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. When you and I think about what we really need, is it not saving from our sins? This invitation that Jesus gives us, and is it not pointing us to another truth that we need healing? from our sins. Is there a doctor in the house? And we understand that cry immediately, that someone is sick, someone has fallen, there is a need for a medical physician. But is there a doctor in the house? I've sinned, I've wronged another, and I am in need of help. Second Corinthians chapter seven, is probably Paul's most joyous words that he expressed in the Christian faith. He admits that there was sin, there was brokenness, and now there is repentance, there's a change of heart. In some of the translations you may have, it says that you were grieved into repenting. In the translation that I read, it said you were made sad enough to change your hearts and lives. In other translations, it says, you felt a godly grief. And for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. In the translation that I read, it said, godly sadness produces a change of heart and life that leads to salvation. A sin is the fact that relationships have been broken and need of mending. And the invitation that Jesus comes to us to save us from our sins is an invitation for us to find healing and salvation. 
that we would welcome that into our lives. And truly the story of Christmas and the life of Jesus comes to save us from our sins because we live in a broken world, a sinful world that's in need of healing and it's in need of saving. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm learning to do what's good for me. And occasionally it can even be noted that I've eaten liver and I've eaten asparagus and I've eaten Brussels sprouts because I believe that they're good for me. And I'm learning to follow Jesus' invitation to follow with a change of heart and life, a life of repentance, a life that admits my sin and the brokenness that I've caused so that it might be healed, that it might be made whole, that it might be saved. Our Savior Jesus Christ has invited you and I to mend the world's broken hearts And I know very well that when we go out and we're in the work of mending, that most, that sometimes, no, really most often, the heart that's mended is our own. What's interesting, putting back to back, is the chapter Luke 15. I hope that you recall that one quickly. That the chapter of Luke 15 has three stories of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and what some would refer to as a lost son. But what's interesting even is what's before that, Luke 14. And Luke 14 is the chapter of excuses. And Jesus tells this parable that there was a great banquet and people were invited to come. And some went out and said, you know, I'd be glad to come, but I've, I've bought some land and I need to go tend to it. You know, I'm busy. It's an excuse that's given. And another one comes along and says, you know, I just bought five oxen and, and I'm busy and, and I need to go tend to the field. I'm busy. The third excuse is rather humorous, and I'm sure it's in there somewhere for all of us to see. A, a, a person, a man says, I, I just got married, and I cannot come. Why can't he come? Do you know why? He's blaming the wife. <laughs> that happened in an earlier story in the Bible, did it not? Adam does what's wrong and he, well, she made me eat it. <laughs> excuses, excuses, excuses. What's interesting is the lost son comes to his senses in Luke 15. And he comes running home to his father and he says, Father, I have sinned against you. And I am not worthy to be called your son. And while the son is coming out with his excuses or his rationalization or his justification, his father interrupts him with the message of forgiveness. What's interesting that the author puts at the end of each of those stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, is a line that repeats itself three times. That there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents. Can you imagine what heaven must be like when you and I begin to accept the invitation of Jesus Christ, that most difficult invitation of Jesus Christ that says, come and repent of your sins. 
Can you imagine what happens in heaven when you and I come and, and answer that invitation and say, Lord, it's me. I have sinned. I have broken your laws. I have rebelled. I have not obeyed you. It's an invitation to do what is good for us. To do what is right for us. To do what will heal us. To do what will save us. In this world that is sick with sin, there is still a need of a good doctor who will come and save us from our sins. The story of Christmas, the invitation of Jesus, it is the one that says, you know, I know that you have done wrong, God says to each and every one of us, but I want you to know that you're loved. You are forgiven. And I hope that you will accept the invitation to live a new life, to change your heart, to repent. For there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous who need no repentance. <clears throat> Let us pray. It's me. It's us, O oh Lord. And we hear the good news that you bring. That even though we have sinned and we have broken hearts, you are the great physician who comes to mend. Mend our broken hearts, O oh God, and may we gladly receive your invitation to come to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is a hymn entitled Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Come home. Sinner, come home. I can't have, think of a better invitation for you and I to receive that invitation that if we have never, if you have never made a dis decision to follow Jesus Christ with your heart, I would invite you to come. If today you wish to join this church, I would invite you to come. But what a glorious invitation it is for all of us sinners to come to that place where we find healing. To come to that place where we find hope. To come to that place where we find salvation. Let us stand and sing this final hymn. We'll sing the first and the last verse.
Please be seated. 